Good morning. Welcome to Sports Radio 1310, The Ticket. <clears throat> George D. John, Train Station Fitness Show. It's 7.02, and <clears throat> I first want to go on record and say that I indemnify myself from this show, all of its opinions. <laughs> I am the interviewer only because I know nothing about this topic I'm bringing to you today. You'll be surprised. <laughs> uh, well, I, oh, yeah. good. Then I'm, if you're telling me I'll know something, then I'm glad. But um, I've had, I, I talked on Facebook, or I wrote on Facebook during the week, that <clears throat> my guest in the studio, Dr. Webster, made a comment saying all doctors, medical doctors and chiropractors, are, are taught the old, outdated neurological model, or the model on neurology, which is back in, I believe you said, 1845, 19, or, the early, or 1930. The early 1930s is about, about 1930s. Right. Yeah. And that for those who do not have or have not gone back to school to learn the latest model in neurology, they are not only not helping their patient to their optimal levels, or they may be ineffective in some, some treatments, but there's a possibility of harm. Now, I want you to know that yesterday, I didn't tell you this, I told you one person, I had some friends of mine who were pissed at me. Oh yeah, I saw it. <laughs> well, yeah, and and I don't understand why because all I'm I'm doing is I'm the interviewer and I was quoting you, so I want people to know if you're a chiropractor, both Dr. Jeremy Webster and myself, we love chiropractors, medical doctors. We love you. There's a place for everybody. Everybody is smart in helping people and wanting to and have the best intentions in the world. However. What often happens, and this happens in the personal training world as well, is people will get a certain set of certifications, licenses, whatever, and they'll stop there thinking they know enough or everything. Exactly. The ego gets in the way. Coming up next, what I want you to do to set the foundation is <clears throat> tell us how you know that medical doctors and chiropractors are taught an outdated form of neurology um, and and how and well let's just we'll start there and then because I want to talk about <clears throat> the basis of each one of them where they come from sure okay and I'll tell you how much I don't know <clears throat> and that's <laughs> a, a lot <laughs> and that's a good thing to know also so while you may be a chiropractor or, or, a, or a, a medical doctor who is not going to be happy with this show don't shoot the messenger. I'm just going to be the interviewer, okay? So we'll talk more with Dr. Jeremy Webster coming up next. It's 7.05, Sports Radio 1310, The Ticket. 7.11, Sports Radio 1310, The Ticket. George D. John, Train Station Fitness Show. Guest in the studio, Dr. Jeremy Webster. Dr. Webster made a profound statement during the week, and I said, are you crazy? This is, this is something that will really <clears throat> perk the interest, pique the interest of, of many people listening because they all want, make, want to make sure that they're being helped to their, to their benefit, right, and their best interest. At the same time, I knew that this was going to, to uh, raise the hair on the back of the neck of med medical doctors and uh, chiropractors who, who do not supposedly, in your words, do not have this type of, of knowledge. You said all doctors are taught an outdated <coughs> model of neurology in school, and you said that uh, uh, those who seek to get the additional training of the latest model would have to go outside and get into a postdoctorate program. True. So, so one of the things you said to me is, George, let's talk about how this neurology helps the average listener from fat loss to muscle building, even rehabilitation. So, so how does this show help or pertain basically to everybody? Well. It's as simple as this, George. The brain controls everything in the body. And that's not just a matter of the brain controls your muscles or the brain controls your organs. The brain controls more than that. The brain controls uh, the tone of your muscles. Uh, the brain controls the speed and the rate of your metabolism. The, the brain controls everything in your body. The brain controls your hormonal system. So when your brain is not functioning optimally, and that's what we're going to talk about later on in the show is how we can actually optimize and, and gauge 
uh, the level and health of the brain. When your brain is functioning optimally, all the other systems in your, in your body function optimally. That means you're going to be as fit as you could possibly be, and you're going to be as healthy as you can possibly be. All right, so let's, let's look at these old models that you, you say. Do we not want to get into the continuous theory, which Absolutely is... Absolutely, we do. Okay, yeah. so, so, so go through these. The 1800 or 1845 model of neurology, I believe what you said was the first model of neurology. It, well, we shouldn't say the first. Um, that we're aware of? Or chiropr taught? Chiropractic was basically discovered in around 1895, okay. and the model at that time was called the continuous theory. George, going way back, going back to the Greeks or the Romans, there was always a, a, a different theory of neurology. I mean, they, they, they at one point thought that the heart controlled um, emotions and, and thoughts and things like that. They thought, they thought the heart was the brain. So there's, there's, no, there's no first theory. But at that time, when chiropractic was discovered, they basically thought that the, the nervous system was all one hardwired piece so that the brain had a hard connection out to the muscles that control your hand, for instance. And so that's called the continuous series, one continuous hardwired um, system. And when chiropractic was discovered, this is kind of an interesting story. This, um, a man named D.D. Palmer, he was, a, he was just a scientist of his time, um, a healer, I guess you could say. He was talking with this janitor who was deaf, and he had a theory about maybe there was some nerve impingement from the, from between the brain and the ears, and he said maybe it happened in the spine. So he started pushing on his spine. He found a spot in his spine. The, the rumor is that it's in the upper back. And where he found that, that fixation or subluxation or, or restriction, whatever you want to call it, subluxation is the word that chiropractors use, he found that he thrust on that spot, made a big pop like, like you're used to with chiropractors, and the, the janitor's hearing was completely restored, at least temporarily. I, the history is a little bit mushy on how long it lasted, but he could hear after that. Now, the funny thing is that that's when chiropractic was born. It was then touted as the cure for deafness. People from all over the world came and there was never another single person that was cured of their deafness. There was never another person cured of their deafness. That's funny. What was the problem with, the, with, that, with that theory? Was it just, or was there a problem with the continuous theory? Well, from a neurological standpoint, it just simply wasn't correct. Okay. The, it's, it's, it's wrong from an anatomical standpoint. The, the brain isn't hardwired connected to the muscles that control your, your, your movements or hardwired, con hardwired connected to your organs. So let's move forward. The 1930s model, the, t the contiguous theory, and you say this is where we're talking about pools of neurons, and I guess is, th is this where the, the brain comes in and, and is not considered separate from the body anymore? Right. The, yeah, I see where you're going with this. Basically, the contiguous theory is the model that are, that's now taught in, in schools. Okay. All chiropractic schools, all medical schools teach the contiguous theory of, of neurology. And it, it basically says that the, that the brain is not hardwired, but rather it, it shoots through one neuron. Then there's a gap between neurons or between nerve cells. Mm -hmm. And those nerve cells then emit or release neurotransmitters or chemicals that trigger other neurons to fire. So it's this step-by-step -step method where, where rather than this hardwired, like you can imagine a copper wire controlling something in your house, it's not like that. Um, this is the model that's currently taught and it's anatomically correct. It's not, it's just not complete as far as physio physiology goes. And then what are the problems with the, the contig to contiguous theory? It's just it's just incomplete. Um, the main the main big problem with it is the contiguous theory assumes that there's a certain number of brain cells that you're born with, or a certain number of nerve cells that you're born with, mm -hmm. and you're basically I shouldn't say hardwired because that go, that, that sounds more like the continuous theory, but it's mm -hmm. set. It's set. It's it's in a in a in a static state, and as you drink alcohol or do something or, or get hit on the head, as you lose brain cells, all you can possibly do is just loom br lose brain cells until eventually you would have no more. Well, you know what's kind of odd is I don't have anywhere near the training that you do and Dr. Maris does and other medical doctors and chiropractors, yet I've known, and maybe it's through the things I've learned with my... Um, uh, when we talk about quantum physics or the philosophy of 
and we talked about the law of attraction, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that I've learned in a lot of the books that I've read um, where they talk about the plasticity of the brain and the, the frontal lobe is always growing that you don't stop learning by a specific age and I forget what age it was that we were told that we can't learn anymore but you, it, it, will, it does actually continually grow and can continually learn until you die. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay, and well, that, I learned that, and how do I learn that with... So, and obviously that's not part of the contiguous theory of 1930, that's the newer model, am I right? Correct. The okay. contiguous theory by itself doesn't take plasticity into account. Now, George, when I say that, that this is the model that we're taught in schools, it doesn't mean that plasticity is never uttered in these schools. Okay. We do talk about plasticity. We just don't go into any detail. We aren't taught from the books that are plasticity-based. We still learn the contiguous theory as the basic model of neurology but there's just so much more to learn beyond that rather than just saying yes the plasticity means that the brain can grow it goes much much further than that you said the the problem was with, with the contiguous theory is that it doesn't explain brain rehabilitation <clears throat> it relies heavily on drugs and you said the brain has the ability to change and grow just like a muscle even grow new brain cells, and you, you mentioned that earlier. So it's it's considered an outdated model, or not? I guess not an an updated model. Right, so when you say when you say and you make this statement that all doctors, all medical doctors and chiropractors are told this old form. <clears throat> before we get into the newer model, how is it that a patient? So we can keep the listeners who are listening now. That, that are not the doctors that just want to go in because they have knee pain, they have excess body fat, that they're, they're, they're craving sugars, they can't sleep at night, they have a disorder, whatever. How is it that the people listening to the show right now can say, relate this to me with the contiguous theory that, the, that doctors have or are using that I'm not benefiting from? How is that? Okay, let's take somebody with knee pain, for example. If it's a chronic knee issue, maybe even a knee and a hip-related re hip issue, that could be because they have an imbalance in muscle tone on that side of the body. What people will do in the, with the contiguous theory, because they don't understand how plasticity can affect brain function and make brain function positively affect muscle tone, they will go directly and start treating that particular knee. Let's say they have a left knee and a left hip issue. Mm -hmm. They'll treat the left side of the body. They're treating the left knee and the left hip. One thing you can do in the pla with the plasticity model, if you understand it, you can actually treat the opposite side of the body to create a positive influence on the <coughs> left hemisphere of the brain, which can then help more, more accurately control muscle tone on the left side of the body, putting your hip and your knee in better alignment. Now let me tell you where I had an experience with this, and I still to this day struggle with it. <clears throat> I had, uh, and you and I discussed this, I had a lady from Upledger, who was a, who was a chiropractor for many years, who doesn't do chiropractic work anymore, she only does cranial sacral work. She's so good at what she does, that her name is Joanne Gallagher, she's so good at what she does that she flies around the United States and only does cranial sacral work. She works from your head down to your feet, not just from your head down to your sacrum. Okay, head down to your feet and then slowly works up the body with every treatment you come back and see her with. And she mentioned that one side of my body was weak but what's hard for me to understand... Relatively weak. <clears throat> well, yeah. Neither side of your body's weak. <laughs> well, what's hard for me to understand is, I, and she talked about it being my right leg. Yeah. What's hard for me to understand is that my right leg, if I'm kicking somebody, if I'm in martial arts and I'm kicking somebody or kicking a bag, the stability I have is greater on my right leg. When I squat or when I lunge, my right leg has more stability to it. It's a little stronger. I recognize this. But she said it's my weaker side. Weaker from a tone standpoint. I, well, she didn't say a tone standpoint. I, I, I know what she's saying. Right. So it was kind of odd for me, but then I looked at it, and my, lateral vast, my, my vastus lateralis, which is the outside muscle of the quad, for people who don't know, where you get that sweeping look, is, is there, there's less muscle there. Because when I was 16, I, I fell off the ladder and broke my knee. Oh. See? I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I, you know, it's just, it's, you, these things come to you when someone says, hey, this is the weaker side of your body. You say, no, it's not. But so, so when, when it gets kind of wacky and a little out there, it makes me say, okay, there's got to be something to this. And I still don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, and that, that cranial sacral stuff works because she's influencing the brain. It all works on this plasticity model. It, you, Go ahead. You can, you can, you can, 
you can do things to affect the brain that aren't necessarily seemingly related to a, a, an area that you would like to treat. Right. But because you positively influence the brain, the brain is better able to control that area that's that's injured or damaged. You said that if you don't, if, if a, a professional doesn't understand the new model, you cannot effectively monitor progress of treatment after only minutes or seconds of therapy. That's true because the, the plasticity model, which we're going to talk about after the break, I guess, yeah. it works in fractions of a second. You can make neurological changes that, mm -hmm. that are detectable in a microsecond. And you just have to you just have to be able to look at rather than look at okay does this part of the brain work or not work that's kind of that's kind of how the contiguous theory teaches us to look at neurology okay look at the pupils do they constrict yes either yes or no so that part of the brain works well plasticity says do they constrict but how well do they constrict do they constrict like they should do they constrict as long as they should do they constrict evenly from side to side and then you can make, you can do something therapeutic and see if you make a change to that part of the brain. So are you sa then saying that although chiropractors and medical doctors ha you're, you use the contiguous theory unless they've gone to postdoctoral training like you have, that they're still able to help their patients, but someone who has a neurodiplomate will be able to help someone on a Grand, more of a grand scale in a shorter period of time. Absolutely, it's it's no different than than a registered dietitian versus a a doctor in clinical nutrition. The registered dietitian can help you eat a little bit better, but the clinical nutritionist can really get in there, do lab work, do much finer analysis, and get much better results for you if you needs if you need that level of care. All right, so coming up next, let's move forward to the to the now. Although it's over 20 years old, the, the new plasticity model, which is back in 1990, um, is the, the model, I guess, that you talked about Nobel, Peace, uh, no, Nobel Prize winner Eric Kandel won uh, back in 2000, because I, I researched his name and I looked at what he was responsible for. Pretty, pretty much of a genius, if you ask me, but if you, oh, yeah. you, can, you can read it on your own. Eric Kandel, it's E-R-I-C for anybody who wants to look at it, last name is K-A-N-D-E-L. We'll talk about the new plasticity model and how it's a postdoctoral degree for someone to get and is not taught in medical school per Dr. Webster. And I also want you to tell us how you know that every single medical school and chiropractic school doesn't teach the new model. How do you know that? Tell us more about that coming up, okay? It's 725, Sports Radio 1310, The Ticket. 7.30 Sports Radio 1310, the ticket, George D. John, train station, fitness show. Dr. Webster is on the show with me. He's a chiropractor, a nutritionist, <clears throat> and he also went back to school to get his neurodiplomate. And he said, George, all doctors, all medical doctors and chiropractors are not taught the new model of plasticity when it comes to neurology. And neurology, <clears throat> excuse me, affects just about every everything you can think of when you think, when you, when you bend down and squat, so the movement of your body. Uh, touch it affects your taste it affects your your uh, your fat gains or fat loss motor patterns name it neurology affects it and he said they're not not effectively treating their patients if they're not taught the latest model this is not George D John's opinion I don't know anything about this I'm learning about it now through dr. Webster just like you can also to say uh, to your doctor do you have the latest Neuro, neuro, neurology model. Have you learned the latest model from 1990 plasticity? If not, how is this not helping me? And and I know that that's a touchy subject because <clears throat> would you say that if a chiropractor or a medical doctor are listening to what you're saying right now, what we're, or what we're about to get into with plasticity, they might think, well, you're nuts if you think that this is the best or only way to treat someone because I've had hundreds or thousands of patients that I've treated and think I'm God. Obviously, we're not talking about George D. John. Right. <laughs> Basically, George, we're not, I'm not saying that doctors aren't effective. <clears throat> All I'm saying is there's always new information out there. And if you get the, the latest information and you understand how to use a lot, utilize it, every doctor can be more effective than they currently are. Good point. If, if I could have 1% of, of all the medical knowledge in the world, George, I would be extremely happy. Mm -hmm. the, the, the knowledge and the information out there is so vast, 
no one can know everything or even a small fraction of everything. So this is just something that I've discovered that has really taken my ability to help patients to the next level. When I got out of chiropractic school, I was well versed in the the contiguous theory of neurons, which every chiropractor and every medical doctor is. I also knew the old philosophy, which goes back actually to the old, like the, the pre-1930 model, the, as we, the, the continuous theory that we talked mm -hmm. about, where chiropractors have basically uh, theorized back in the 1800s that what was happening was bones were out of place and they were pushing on nerves. Mm -hmm. And this was causing disruption to all the vital organs in your body. That maybe was what was causing the, the Harvey Lillard to not be able to hear because that, that nerve was being compressed by a bone. And by adjusting the, the, the joints or the bones, they relieved pressure and then energy was able to flow to those end organs. Well, we know it, any, every chiropractor who's taken the contiguous theory of neurology, the contiguous theory, knows that that is not true because when you have pressure on a nerve, you lose muscle function and you lose sensation and then you get twitching, whether it's detectable by, by sight and, and feel or maybe detectable by, by measurements. Mm -hmm. um, that's what happens when you have pressure on a nerve. You don't get just simple end organ, end organ failure. So we know that this is wrong, but this still is something that perpetuates in the chiropractic field. Now this doesn't mean that the chiropractic adjustment doesn't help organs and your, your metabolism and your system as a whole. It's just not explained right, is all, is all I'm saying. It's not explained right. And if you understand the new model, which does properly explain why chiropractic can be so beneficial to things, not just headaches and back pain and neck pain, but other things relating to your general health. When you understand the plasticity Yeah, model, but now you're, change, you're, you're changing your tune in a way because you're saying it now, <clears throat> what the new model is saying is it explains it right. Earlier, you weren't talking about it being explained differently. What you said specifically was that the testing is more detailed, it's more involved. And if the testing is more detailed and involved, you're going to get a different reading, which might give you a different uh, 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 treatment for that person. Not necessarily an explanation about why you're working a specific treatment is going to work for you. What you're saying is exactly right. I was just trying to make the point the chiropractors can be extremely effective. Medical doctors, physical therapists, occupational therapists can all be extremely effective without understanding plasticity. But if you understand plasticity, you can take it to that next level and your effectiveness of your treatment will go up with that with this additional knowledge. But the knowledge. treatment may change also. It may change or it may not change. Okay, so Nobel, I, I might, Nobel, I, Nobel Prize winner, let's go ahead and get into this because we don't have much time. Nobel Prize winner Eric <coughs> Kandel who is a psychiatrist, a neuroscientist, a professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the Columbia University of College and Physicians and Surgeons, accepted the Nobel Prize in 2000 in, physiolo in physiolo phys this is physiology, check me out, or I need the neurology uh, do. plasticity uh, <laughs> model, or medicine for his research on, on a physiological basis of memory storage in neurons so what the hell does all that mean it means it means he validated the plasticity model okay. that's that's all that means sim quite simply memory is plasticity when when you are when you see something or hear something and it goes into your brain and you create a memory it's your brain cells adapting or creating new connections that weren't there before you were had that that environmental stimulus let's say i i tell you something related to neuroplasticity that you didn't know before, George. Mm -hmm. Your brain changes. Your brain so, instantly so then, changes. So then a, a logical question for you. For those who didn't believe that plasticity existed or that we had the ability to learn until we died, how is it that they were able to explain away or dismiss your grandmother or grandfather who did crossword puzzles and, and was alert until the day they died. Maybe they couldn't walk, they were in a wheelchair, but they were very alert. I mean, isn't that logical or, or am, I, am I making no. like dumbing it down or what is it? No, that, that's exactly right. And that's okay. exactly what I thought as I was going through school is that you, you had to know that this model is incomplete. It's not, it's not incorrect, it's just incomplete. Um, because it doesn't explain how the brain changes. You can't tell me that, that our brain doesn't change when I can go read a book and I can remember what I read. My brain has new information in it. It's not the same as it was before. So it doesn't stop at a specific age. So let's go ahead and talk about the 1990s plasticity model that you said all chiropractors and medical doctors do not have unless they went back to school for a postdoctoral degree in a, to get a neurodiplomate. What is that? 
Okay, we go to the contiguous theory where we have different pools of neurons and we have gaps, remember? Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm a brain cell or maybe a receptor like a skin receptor that detects uh, touch pain. or vibration or pain or whatever, um, I send that signal to another neuron. There's a gap between me and between you. Now, your job, George, might be to stimulate the cerebellum. It's a, piece, it's a part of the brain that has to do with balance, we'll say. Well, if I... If my job is to throw a certain neurotransmitter, acetylcholine or something like that, uh, serotonin, dopamine, these are all just chemicals that the, the neurons release. If my job is to release that and, and activate you, your job, you actually change based on that activation, even if I don't activate you enough to make you fire, mm -hmm. okay? But just the, just the fact that I'm poking you on the arm makes you change that makes you have neuroplastic change. You actually replicate protein. Your your nucleus of your of your cell is stimulated, and you start generating protein, which makes you healthier, and you start growing more connections to the brain cells around you. The reason is, you know that since you're being activated, that you have value. Okay, there's going to be a, a need for you someday, so you have to maintain your health. If there's another neuron that I'm supposed to activate also that I never bother activating the body knows instinctively that that neuron must not be very important. So that neuron will start to wither and die. While you, as I keep activating you, you get stronger and stronger. Now, to activate you fully, to let you fire and, and light up that cerebellum, it might take a, a punch, which that's enough to wake you up and you go do your job. But if I just, if I just tap you all day, that's still activation. That still makes you, causes you to have neuroplastic change. Okay, in, so in, how am I rambling? Here? Yeah, 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 in, in a way, you are rambling. I, I hear what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. But how does that differ from the contiguous theory? You have doctors right now that are listening to you and saying, "Okay, I understand what you're talking about, but I already knew that, Doctor Webster, or didn't they?" Probably not. Oh, really? Okay. Probably not in that aspect. It's it's the activation. It's actually the activation from the from the brain cell or the receptor before you, which causes your health. It's not you firing the, that keep that maintains your health. It's the activation from me. So if I, stop, if I stop stimulating you, you start to die, okay? If I stimulate you, you become healthier and healthier and healthier because... And who are you again for people who just turned us on? I'm, I'm a brain cell. You're that, a brain cell. I'm a brain cell before you. Right. My job is to activate you. You're another, you're another brain cell. We have a gap between us where we, where we release chemicals and, and speak back and forth, but your health is dependent on me. Now, if we go back to the old theory, the contiguous theory, uh -huh. it's... It's basically it's chemistry based. It's it's nothing but chemistry in the contiguous model. So it's only the the chemicals that I release is the only importance. They don't take into account that it's my activation. It's my firing to stimulate you is what keeps you healthy. So what you're saying is then less need for medication? Potentially, because we can do a lot with activation, presynaptic activation to to make you healthy rather than just feed you the chemicals. That, that I would normally be feeding. Where would that show up as far as less activation and less medication is concerned? And that was just a guess, by the way, so I don't want to be the guy who knows anything here. Well, let's say, let's, let's take uh, Parkinson's, for example. Mm -hmm. There's a specific part of the brain called the substantia nigra, which is responsible for releasing dopamine and triggering this, this, this chain of events, this chain of neurological uh, firing that activates initiation of thought, initiation of action, of, of motor, motor function. When those part cells start to die, they, have, they don't fire as well, so the rest of, the, of that circuitry starts to decay and wither. But you can do things to activate those parts of the brain. Some, some people think you just have to go in there and start giving um, dopamine, which does kind of work. But what you can also do is feed specific parts of the brain with external stimulus. Mm -hmm. And you can make the, that part of the brain as healthy as it can possibly be. You might have lost a certain percentage of your brain cells in that part if you have Parkinson's. In fact, you, you have lost certain, a certain percentage of brain cells. But that doesn't mean that those brain cells that currently exist can't be made much healthier and much stronger so that they can do a lot of the activity that they used to do. So now a doctor who did not get this latest model of plasticity uh, called plasticity in neurology may, listening to the show right now, may argue with you and say you're nuts because of lack of knowledge, am I correct? Or would they agree with you because they should have this knowledge? Well, <clears throat> someone, I'm sorry, someone who deals with, who does treat Parkinson's. Someone who does treat Parkinson's might have this knowledge or they might not. They, they certainly know the substantia nigra and the dopamine, but they might just be treating with chemistry. 
But what I'm saying is you can, you can use external stimulus to stimulate certain parts of the brain and make those parts of the brain healthier from an actual structural standpoint. The brain cell itself will make new connections and become stronger and become healthier and be able to better carry out its function. And the chemistry might work along with it really well. So the two can go hand in hand, but you're going to get the best results if you're taking advantage of this knowledge. So earlier, before we went to break, I asked you how you know <clears throat> that all medical doctors and all chiropractors don't have this knowledge today in school. When did you graduate? I graduated in 2006. 2006. So, our, so in 2006, which, which college did you go to for chiropractic? Parker Chiropractic here in Parker. Dallas. Parker. Is Parker a good one? It's considered one of the best, yeah. Uh, it's considered the best, isn't it? Or the, one of the best? Everybody thinks they're the best, but okay. Parker's, Parker's a great school. That's okay. why I went there. Because uh, I've always heard it was considered the best, but what do I know? Anyway, so it's considered the best. If it's considered the best or one of the best, it's going to be taught the latest in chiropractic, right? right. But it's not taught, you know this for 100% sure, you were not taught the 1990 plasticity model of neurology. I was not taught that. In mm -hmm. fact, one of my neurology professors is a neurodiplomate also. And he was trying to get us to, to switch and use the, the textbook by Eric Kandel. It's called Ken, Kandel and Schwartz are the two writers of this textbook. It's massive, George. It's, it's probably five inches thick. And the school wouldn't allow it because they weren't ready to, to phase into that particular uh -huh. model. He talked a little bit about it in yeah. school, yeah. but we still had to learn from the contiguous model. And then he would just give us a little, little teasers here and there, but, but we didn't have like a full-on class. You can't learn plasticity right. just just in passing. It's right. not just a matter of what you know that the brain does in fact grow. It's much more well, complex I imagine than it is. that. And it's I would imagine exact. you would need to know the, the, the contiguous theory first. So um, moving forward, let's talk about how if you don't have this model, how it could affect other parts of your body. Because you said that the old neurology model or technique um, can't help people, I guess, to recover from injury, surgery, or whatever it is, faster than what you can do with the new model. Is that correct? Yeah. If you have a good understanding of plasticity, you can positively affect virtually every system in the body. And I think we should just elaborate on that after the break. But yes, any, any kind of health-related issue can be positively affected if you understand how to take advantage of plasticity. You said an important point is the new model plasticity in the 1990s t teaches us how the health of the brain can no longer be thought as a separate organ. Do the people in the contiguous theory in the 1930s still think it's a separate organ or to today do they know it's not? It, it has to be treated as a separate organ in the contiguous theory. Did, were you taught in 2006 that it was a, a separate organ? Yeah. You were? Yeah. Isn't it kind of funny how... I don't. I didn't think of. I don't think of it that way. But then again, who the hell am I? I didn't go here through schooling. Well, a lot of the stuff that I do is through logic, well, and I know that, again through all of the studying I've done with quantum mechanics and 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 the law of attraction has taught me so much. Not the way you've been taught, but in a different way, in a different sense, to to know that everything is connected. Right. Everything connects to everything. Everything affects everything. Well, yeah, and, and we're made of what seventy percent water. We know we can affect water. Doctor Emoto's. Uh, uh, great uh, uh, study, what he's d done with water and back and forth, and I don't want to get into that type of show, but the things that I've learned that make me say, okay, well, there's a lot of validity to this, so let's let's de delve more into it. So what I'd like to do coming up next is talk more about the plasticity model, about how it affects the average Joe. Okay, yeah. we touched on it only a little bit. And, and do you think that other chiropractors listening to you now and other medical doctors think that you're either a traitor, because I'm sure some of them may with this show, thinking that your well, knowledge that you've got is, is more effective or, or effective and, and theirs is it because you know how people absorb information, or do you think that they're thinking that you're just trying to get a leg up on your practice with this type of talk? I'm just trying to make people aware. There's, there's plenty of things that I don't know, George, and there's things that I probably need to learn to make me a better clinician yeah. that other chiropractors understand that I have no clue about. I just want people to be aware of this because it will. It, it took my practice to a next, to a next level as far as uh, patient outcomes. I'm not a trader. I love chiropractic. Re basic standard chiropractic from a guy that learned chiropractic in the 1950s is extremely effective. But this just makes it better. 
Okay. We like better, we like new, we like advanced, and we like optimal. Let's talk more with Dr. Jeremy Webster coming up next, 747 Sports Radio 1310, the ticket. 752 Sports Radio 1310, the ticket. George D. John, <clears throat> excuse me, train station fitness show. You know, with all this great weather we have, um, it's also bringing up <clears throat> the stuff I'm, I'm allergic to, and that's cedar. It kicks my butt. So Dr. Webster's on the show, and we're talking about a topic that hopefully we didn't lose the, the people who are trying to attain their fat loss goals, their fitness and health and fitness goals for the new year, if they're in that New Year's, uh, New Year resolution mode. N what you may not recognize from this show is that there are professionals who can help you. If you think of a chiropractor, we always think of them treating a subluxation, a subluxation or, or, or realigning the back or a joint not recognizing they have fantastic knowledge when it comes to whether it be neurology or, or uh, nutrition today. And that if you have struggles with, for anyway, again, fat loss or rehabilitation issues, that there are certain people for specific tasks that really can help you out. The one thing I encourage you to do, if you want, tell me if I'm wrong about this, Dr. Webster, from what I've learned, if you want optimal and faster treatment for a condition that the specialist you're going to uh, is, 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 can help you with, you would like for them to have this latest information. But it doesn't mean, again, per what your words were earlier, that if they use the contiguous model from the 1930s, that they can't help you. It just may not be the optimal way of helping you and a faster way. Is that correct? George, let, let's take an example here. Let's say somebody is mm -hmm. interested in just losing weight and getting fit. Well, if I, if I would look at the two different parts of the brain, the left hemisphere of the brain and the right hemisphere of the brain, if one hemisphere of the brain is not functioning as well as the other, let's say the left, fun left is functioning poorly compared to the right, I know based on what the, the, the general function of the left hemisphere is that that person has an increased stress response compared to what they should. So if I would stimulate if I would adjust that person on the right side of the body to stimulate the left brain and bring that, the function of the left brain up so that's in balance, that person's going to experience less stress in their body, they're going to have less of a, of a cortisol response, and they're going to be able to burn fat and, and attain a, a good healthy weight much easier than if I would adjust them on the opposite side of the body and make that imbalance even worse. So what you just said is you just gave us an example <clears throat> of the new plasticity model versus the old and one giving you a faster result. Right, because okay. I, can, I can positively influence the health and the, the function of the brain or different pieces of the brain based on where I stimulate the body, just like a muscle. If your left arm is weaker than your right arm but it works perfectly well, all you have to do is exercise it and, and bring the strength of your left arm up. The pieces of the brain work exactly the same based on what we know from plasticity. This may sound silly, but does one type of treatment last longer than the other? Yes, it depends how, how hard you activate or how how uh, intensely you activate yeah. those brain cells. Like I said, I can throw little paper wads at you and that's activation that kind of keeps you healthy, but I have to hit you with a hammer or punch you in order for you to fire and fire onto that next brain cell ahead of you. So it depends how strongly I stimulate from, the, from an external source, could be vibration, could be movement, could be electricity. sound, electricity, light, sound, wh whatever, right. smell, all these things activate neurons, which then fire onto neurons after them. So if you, if you fire like, do a chiropractic adjustment of the neck, that's the most dense population of receptors in the body are the, the, the receptors, the mechanical receptors in the upper neck. So when you do that, you're getting maximum stimulation, which might not be good. Chiropractors, I'm sorry out there, that might not be good in every situation because that might overstimulate the brain. So, so wait, 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 you said chiropractors, I'm sorry. I'm, Are you suggesting or, or letting everybody know a secret that chiropractors like to overstimulate and they don't realize that they're doing maybe some more damage? I wouldn't like say there? that they like to overstimulate, but sometimes it's possible to overstimulate by doing an adjustment if it's not appropriate for that patient. If a patient mm -hmm. is just down in the dumps and their metabolism is horrible and their brain is extremely unhealthy, a chiropractic adjustment on the upper neck might be too much stimulation and it might actually cause brain cells to, to, to die. I'd like to go on record and say that during the break we talked to my friend Dr. Kerry Tyvitt, uh, who's an ear, ear, nose and throat doctor in Seneca, South Carolina. Um, he was just on the phone with uh, Dr. Webster and myself on, on uh, speaker and said that he does have Eric Handel's book, right? Right. And he 
graduated med, med school in 2003, is that what it was? Yeah, that's what yeah. you said. Med school in 2003. So, that proves what you said is wrong the, the, about all doctors. The book, the book is taught, but he didn't understand the, the model that I was talking about. Right, but what I'm saying is, is wrong. I wasn't finished. What you said was wrong, that they weren't taught it. However, they were not taught this specific model rather than what you said you were taught in school the the contiguous 1930s model with bits and pieces of the new plasticity model which sounds like i'm guessing dr tybett may have had some of the same yeah you're going to get the contiguous theory every every neurology text is going to have the contiguous theory but then this kendall and kendall and schwartz kendall and schwartz book does go into neuron receptor theory and and neuron theory and all these things which you just simply don't have time to do in medical school and chiropractic school it's too many additional hours that we don't have there's only a certain amount of how many hours how many how many uh, years did it take you to get this postdoctoral uh, it, it was nine trimesters which which you can cram wow. into three years, three years. If, you, if you go all summer long it's a four-year four-year school just like wow. any, any other Isn't that amazing can, can you name off just because you're on the show so many times can you name off several people who have <clears throat> this neurodiplomate, whether they be medical doctors or chiropractors, just name off some names because some of the people listening may not know you, but they might know some of those names. Do you know some? Yeah, uh, Dr. Ted Carrick is the guy who really is kind of the the head of the of the neurodiplomate program. Yeah, uh, he taught uh, my mentor, which is Dr. Brandon Brock, which is a, a guy in town here in the Dallas area. Brilliant guy, uh, has a couple different types of practices around town. Um, Dr. John D'Onofrio. Are these the all president. chiropractors? Uh, yes. Okay. These are chiropractors. Don, John D'Onofrio is the head of the, uh, he's the president of the Chiropractic Neurology Board. And I've taken some really good um, applied class, uh, applied neurology classes from him mm -hmm. to where he took, he took what, what we, we know in the plasticity model and he made it so that every chiropractor can apply it after maybe 12 hours of training. It just, it's a, it's a good quick way to, to increase your skills as a chiropractor by understanding the fundamentals and how, how the fundamentals of plasticity affect it. Now, the neurodiplomate is hundreds and hundreds of hours. And, I mean, I've spent 15 hours talking about nothing but receptors. Wow. So it, it gets really involved when you're talking about really getting down to the, the nitty-gritty of this. La last week's show, I had Dr. Frank Barnhill on, who is a uh, medical doctor, and he talked about ADHD, what that is, and how we're kind of missing the mark today on people who are... Uh, diagnosing for it and don't and shouldn't be because he said that <clears throat> that most doctors don't have the qualifications they're not properly trained to diagnose people properly with ADHD and it's on YouTube by the way we got some of the shows loaded back on YouTube so if you go to YouTube put in 21 day body makeover.com but he said George in my practice <clears throat> I have a, a, a physical therapist, I have a nutritionist, I have these people, I have these people. I believe we should all come together and work in the best interest of the patient. I said, oh my God, that's been my mission for the past 13 years. And plasticity will improve. It, it, ADHD is all about plasticity. If you figure out what part of the brain needs to be healthier, stimulate it properly, plasticity takes over. Good deal. If you want to get in touch with Dr. Webster and you want to yell at him, tell him he's wrong, or say, hey, thank you for the information, give me more, call him 972-735-0707.